Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come before thee now and ask for thy gracious blessing. Be with us, O Lord, this evening. Throughout the whole hour, we meet together. And Lord, remember us uh, this evening and throughout this week. We pray for grace upon grace. And pray, O Lord, all might be to thy glory. Amen. Our reading this evening is in Matthew 18 and from verse 1 to verse 22. Hear the word of God. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offences, for it must needs be that offences come, but woe to that man by whom the offence cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven the angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall, uh, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, uh, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his holy word. 
the announcements this evening. On Friday we have a fellowship and prayer meeting at 8 o'clock. Saturday at 11 in the morning uh, we have our Persian meeting. Then the Lord's Day, uh, 9.30 in the morning, uh, Sunday School on YouTube, 10.30, a uh, morning service at Penamine Road, and also on YouTube, 3.30 in the afternoon, Capital Wrath, the Welsh service on YouTube, and 6 o'clock in the evening, our evening service at Tabernacle Cardiff on YouTube. All God willing, and we pray with God's richest blessing. Hymn 322, 322. One that is above all others, well deserves the name of friend. Hymn 322. again before we look at the passage before us. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we come before Thee. We thank Thee for Thy grace. O oh Lord, for sins forgiven, for eternal life. O oh Lord, we could say, what more do we want that we have God Himself? O oh Lord, what a great 
blessing has come to our hearts. We who were born in sin and were sinners have found the grace of God in this life. We thank thee, O Lord, for the riches and the unsearchable riches which now are ours and which we have uh, partaken of in part. Uh, but we know that the great riches lie before us. In a way, O Lord, we are like the treasure seekers of this world as they seek the gold. But our gold is the very best gold and we have found it. And indeed, we continue along this gold trail, we could call it. O oh Lord, but much more sanctified and glorified than that image. It is indeed uh, to know the Lord in our heart more and more, to be changed from glory into glory. Then, O oh Lord, to cross over that narrow stream of death into that great place where, O oh Lord, thou art found in fullness, in fullness of thy glory. And, Lord, to be with thee, a true sense of coming home, that our souls now desire thee, O Lord. And uh, this place is no home to us, although we have many lovely friends and family and blessings which encourage our hearts. And yet there is a yearning in our hearts to be with our God. And so it shall, O Lord, we know, according to thy promises. And we shall be kept in life, because thou hast said so in thy word. And we shall be brought before God. O oh Lord, we pray that these thoughts might dominate in our minds more and more. And O oh Lord, in this life, we might know more of looking to Thee also. And we might rely upon Thee, might share our hearts with Thee. And we pray now this evening as we bow our heads in prayer, we might bring before Thee the concerns of our heart, many of them are to do with our lives and what surrounds us immediately. But thou art gracious, O Lord, and patient to hear us. And O Lord, we thank thee uh, that in that sense thou art a true father to us. We can take these things to thee, and thou dost hear us and answer our prayers. And thou dost deliver, thou dost help um, to deliver us out of our difficulty or to be with us in our difficulty. And sometimes, O oh Lord, it is both because we know that in the end, Lord, thou dost deliver all thy people. We know this great truth. Thou art mindful of us. And, O oh Lord, thou dost help us along life to bring us to good places and paths of righteousness and to bless us richly. And indeed, O oh Lord, we do pray for those heart blessings and to come to thee with the woes of our heart and the failings to come uh, for forgiveness, uh, coming in the blood of Christ, uh, to be reminded that all our sins have been washed away, but also to confess our sins, that we might walk closer to Thee. O oh, Father, we pray we might indeed be such people who are close to our God. So hear our prayers now. And as the Lord, we look at this passage, and in a way we Walk with thee uh, through this passage. Lord, be with us. Teach us. Keep us from error. Bless us with the truth, we pray, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and his precious blood that washed away our sins, and his righteousness which covers us all together. We pray these things unto the glory of our God. Amen. Well, let's turn to that passage, and uh, especially verse 20. And this promise, this promise made by our Saviour, there are many promises in the Bible. And this is one of them, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Now I prepare some thoughts, but even as I read that, some other thoughts came to my mind. So I trust we shall cover the ground adequately this evening. But this promise is simple and encouraging. This promise is profound and heavenly. 
the connection here between heaven and earth that our Savior who is the Savior in the right hand of God presences, presences his, himself uh, with, with his people on earth but before we work our way through these words uh, phrase by phrase uh, let's just note how these words sit in the passage and we see here mention of numbers, quite a few references to numbers in this passage. There's one and there's two, uh, two or three, uh, 70 times seven also mentioned, another mentions two. And there seems to be a theme in our Saviour's words as he goes from truth to truth and these numbers seem to, to feature. Uh, just note some of them with me. Uh, the importance of the one is in Verse 12, or seeking the one out of a hundred sheep, the ninety and nine, and the one, and seeking the one which is lost. And then in verse 16, uh, thoughts of the church and church discipline and problems in the church. And there it speaks of two or three witnesses to testify. And then in verse 19, wonderful promise there too. Tremendous promise uh, where uh, two, if two shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. That uh, when we pray in his name, it shall be done. And our text here, where two or three are gathered and Christ is in the midst. Uh, see the words, for where two or three are gathered, together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And uh, in verse 22, there you have the mention of 70 times 7. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, not to forgive seven times, but 70 times 7. Which of course is a number, but the point there is to continually forgive. And so we come to this phrase before us this evening and in verse 20 for where two or three are gathered together in my name there am i in the midst of them this matter of two or three but first of all let's look at some other words in this sentence uh, where for where and just pass over two or three for a moment for where two or three are gathered together. So those expressions for where and are gathered together. So what is the location uh, and occasion of this gathering that is so blessed of Christ? Well, it could be any occasion really uh, where two or three Christians meet together, either by arrangement or by chance meeting. Perhaps to pray together, as that is the context of the, context of the previous verse, uh, to pray together, uh, or also to fellowship together, to speak of the Lord. All those situations will be covered by this verse. But without doubt, it also refers to the church and the meetings of the church on the Lord's Day, and any day come to that. Now the whole concept of the church in the scriptures is to be called out of the world, to meet together, to assemble together. And put that alongside this verse and other verses similar to it. And then the doctrine of the union in Christ, that our souls are joined to Christ, but also Christ is the head, we are the body, the church is the body. It's not surprising then. There's a connection between us when we meet together, the body, the head is present also, the presence of Christ when we meet together as God's people. But let me just say a few more things about being gathered together and in a certain location where and gathered. Uh, this matter of a place where we meet and we gather together. Now, of course, we would naturally think of a church building, but even then, with our church buildings, uh, we meet in other places too. Uh, we meet in homes, uh, for example. Um, sometimes churches 
meeting rented halls. So we would have to include such places as that. Or even rooms in schools down some corridor, uh, turn left, turn right, and uh, second door on the right or something, whatever it might be. Some out of the way place or in colleges, in uh, the labyrinth of, of, of colleges, there's somewhere in the building, a church has hired a place and there they meet. All these places would be included. But going back in the history of the early church, they had no buildings. Let's remind ourselves of that. <coughs> and they met in each other's homes. Indeed, the very first meeting that we could refer to uh, was in the uh, upper room. And we note uh, they met in secret and that indeed was often the case. Uh, not in open view in the public as we do in our country at the moment. But think of the persecuted church. It was the case in our country not so long ago and may well be the case in the future. Our time is quite unusual really uh, if you think of the history of the world and the church. But of course even today in other countries uh, the church is persecuted and they have to meet in secret in homes, uh, often because of fear of being uh, discovered and arrested and uh, tortured, put to death, put in prison. Uh, they are not able to sing for fear of being heard and have to be careful and have lookouts to warn if the authorities are arriving. Sometimes also in the history of the church they would meet in out-of-the-way places, in forests and other such places. As we think of forests, a um, fairly famous example of a small congregation of six believers uh, in the time of the Covenanters who were discovered by soldiers. Uh, they were met, uh, they had met secretly to pray together in a place called Calden's Wood, I believe, in Glen Trool in Scotland. And so the troop of soldiers found them and put them to death in the time of the Covenanters and many such examples like that in the history of the Covenanters and also in many other histories. And all this puts in context uh, our, situ our situation at this present time in the pandemic uh, where for some time we could not meet in person but now we can meet at least partly so in a limited way is very different to what we were used to, uh, sitting apart, um, no singing, uh, wearing of masks uh, in some parts of the country, uh, obligatory, uh, other places it is advisory, uh, little fellowship, uh, all uh, different in, in many ways to what was true, uh, say, nine months ago. And of course we do meet electronically and we're able to do that in in these times uh, sometimes gathering together on zoom meetings where we can interact sometimes watching the same message on youtube or some similar facility uh, at a given time uh, we all know that we gather in our homes and uh, we watch a live recording uh, whether it's pre-recorded or live uh, it doesn't really matter uh, there are differences in that but uh, you have to think of uh, the depend dependability of, 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 of the technology. And even if we do watch at different times, not say 10.30 or 6 o'clock or 7.30, and we watch at different times, we still gather together around the same passage, in the same period of time. Now, of course, a fully functioning church is our preference, but we are very glad for the provisions of technology at this time and appreciate the opportunities here too. Some are included or more included because of the advance in technology over the last six months. Uh, now there's more on the internet. More churches are able to provide this service. We also appreciate that some are excluded who are not uh, so uh, technical in their ability and don't have the facilities and they might lose out in this time. 
But all in all, of course, our preference is to meet in person and also broadcast to have all the advantages. Of course we do. We want it all. We want to meet in person. We want as much as possible to be online, to reach as many people as possible. But note this, and this is what I'm leading up to. In all these varying circumstances, it is the Lord's people gathering together. The Lord is not limited by our limitations. He has promised to be present with us in all circumstances, whatever form that gathering takes. Understand the power here. Whatever the circumstances, that can vary, have advantages, disadvantages. But that's not the point. The presence and the power of Christ, when we gather together, don't underestimate the presence of Christ when we decide to meet together in whatever format that is. Or that we might have a vision for the gospel and not be distracted by disadvantages and try to work around some solution, but rather uh, to get on with it, to accept the circumstances. Sometimes we have to think it through, but mostly to get on with it. And also to come with our hearts, not be distracted by opinions and all these things that come along with uh, changing circumstances. But if you're focused, we gather together the best we can, in any way we can. But the great issue is Christ has promised to be with us when we gather together. And one final point here at this point, uh, maybe an obvious point. The church is the people, not the building, as this verse indicates. The place is incidental, where, wherever, you could say, wherever they meet and gather, Christ has promised to be there. The people is the thing. The two and three, the Lord's people, is the key thing there. And then, moving on to the phrase two or three, we come to this number, two or three. It is not two or three hundred, or two or three thousand even. It is two or three, and even two. Let's note that as well. Two or three is two. Even when two gather, Christ has promised to be there when they meet in his name. This is a promise for small churches. It's also the same promise for large churches. The same promise for all the churches of Christ, whatever the size they are. Of course, there is a blessing when many meet together. Uh, there are pluses about that, but these are the minor details. The great plus is the same for two or three as two or three hundred. Christ is there with them. And think of the dignity and the glory accompanying two or three meeting together in the name of Christ. Christ is with them, this dignity and glory. So often uh, those who are in small churches apologize for their numbers. They should not. They are the Lord's people and Christ is with them. The glory, the dignity of that meeting. I would also suggest in this verse, as we look at two or three uh, meeting together and Christ being there, uh, just the fact of gathering uh, there are blessings associated with meeting that we cannot get when we are on our own as individuals. Now, there are many blessings that Christ promises to us as individuals, but there are particular, peculiar blessings that can only be found when we gather together. And just this thought that Christ is there in this gathering, that alone would be an attraction to us, an encouragement to make sure we are in these gatherings. And this blessing uh, is the same blessing in small or large churches because the place is full of God and full of Christ. As I just said earlier, just to emphasize that, uh, it's called the meeting house. Very often the churches were called the meeting house. Yes, we meet together, but primarily we meet with him is a meeting house because we meet with God and meet with Christ. 
and the place is full of Christ. You don't find this presence in other assemblies of the world. Here in the church, Christ has promised to be in these meetings. Well, we say more about the nature of these blessings in a while. Before we do, just note the phrase, in my name, where two or three are gathered together in my name. Now, this says a few things to us. It certainly indicates the purpose of our meeting. Uh, we meet to worship as the Lord's people and to pray together. And we come uh, through Christ. Uh, certainly, we uh, mention him. He's our access to God. And we preach about him. Uh, this also indicates who we are. We are born again. We are God's people. Uh, when we come in his name, it's because we are Christ and we have believed in him. We are born again. And a church is made up of born again people who believe in Christ. And our purpose is to worship God through Christ and we preach Christ, preach the gospel. All this is included in this phrase. But not this also. And this perhaps is the secret of this phrase. It says something about our hearts. Yes, we come through Christ, we mention Christ, we preach Christ, but also we wish to exalt him and to glorify God. And when we come in his name for the purposes of exalting him and of lifting him up and of glorifying God, and uh, not for selfish purposes or to promote our own cause, but rather for the kingdom of God and the name of Christ. When we come in that spirit, it brings him down. You could say this is like a condition of the promise. And I think it is. Uh, the first part of the condition is that we are the Lord's. And we come in his name. But there's more to it. We come uh, for the purpose of his name. And that brings down the blessing and the degree of blessing, I suggest. He comes into our midst. Well, there's more in this short verse. We see, there am I, those words. There am I in the midst of them. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Now we come to the heart of the blessing of the extra one in the meeting. So whenever there are two, in fact, there is three. And whenever there are three, there is in fact four. And whenever there are 200, there is in fact 201. Because the Lord is that extra one. And think of this also. Of all the meetings that take place, especially on the Lord's Day, uh, all the many meetings that take place on the Lord's Day, Christ has promised to be in all of them. He surely is God, omnipresent. It speaks of his divinity uh, for the one thing. It also speaks of his interest in the cause and in the meeting of his people, that he is there. You know, we go to one meeting, don't we? Uh, we are called to be faithful in one meeting. Christ is in them all, in all the meetings. But what kind of presence is represented with these words, there am I? They are dramatic words, I suggest to you. There am I. Well, certainly it speaks of his omnipresence. Yeah, we've alluded to that just now. The simple fact is there. But in what way is he there? Is he active in any way? Is he there as an observer? Well, certainly he does observe. He's there seeing it all. But also he is active. He makes himself known. There are degrees of his activity and his presence. Thinking of one of the revivals when a man cried out, He has come! It matches this expression here. There am I! He has come, said this man. And what he meant, of course, was not that he was not there at all before, but he has manifested himself and in that sense has come to the meeting. We understand what that means. 
But of course, we should also recognize, although that is overwhelming, tremendous, and something we long for, we should not forget that there is surely a degree of his presence in all our meetings. As even when we feel that was a cold meeting and slow spiritually, and often we think that, but you know the Lord is there. And even in those circumstances, when many of our hearts are cold and dull, yet the Lord is still there, uh, working through his spirit, touching one heart, perhaps out of the congregation, uh, and another there, perhaps. Um, one heart here and another heart there, perhaps. But more often than not, touching many hearts as the word is preached, as we sing the hymns and the word of God is read, uh, Christ is there. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is working in the hearts of the people. Saying something through the passage, touching the heart, stirring the heart, convicting of sin, encouraging another. And there are times of anointing, even short of the great revival powers that our church has known in past times. There are times of anointing of the Spirit. Not just this almost secret work of the Spirit, which we are almost unaware of, yet when we reflect we know it is Him. But there are times we would not say He has come in that way, and yet we know He is here, and touches of anointing upon our heart. And even though we are taken up with the truth, and whatever is being perhaps preached or read or sung, uh, yet, yet uh, we, we, we can reflect upon it and know in the back of our minds it is Him, He is there. And in that sense, how true this phrase, there am I, there am I, thank God for that. He makes a difference between our meetings and all the other meetings of the world. Christ is there in our meetings and He can be present to lift our earthly gatherings into the heavenlies. There are heavenly moments. All of us surely have known touches of this. You can think back on your life now and think of seasons, occasions, how true this is. Hear the words of John Owen, which I've quoted many times before. Worship, says John Owen, is performed in heaven Though they who perform it are on earth, yet they do it by faith in heaven. And that is true, and it can be experientially true also in our experience. And then we come to this expression, in the midst of them, there am I in the midst of them. That is a wonderful expression as well in the midst of them. It's a lovely truth that reminds us a little of the words in Revelation chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. These are the churches, the seven churches. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down, down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. But in the midst of the churches, there he was, in the midst and walking amongst his churches. And this matter, and it is in our verse as well, there, I, there am I in the midst of them. Now let's think of this again, it's similar to some of the things we said regarding there am I, but it has some different aspects. Our Saviour is in the middle of us. It's not on the outside, it's not on the edges as an observer, he's rather in the midst of us. We mention he's there, but where is he exactly? He's in the midst of us, it says in this verse. He's one of us. He has the name of brother. We are brothers in Christ. He also has the name of brother to his people. And of course he is 
the perfect brother, the brother par excellence. And you could say he's seated in the pews with us, or even in the pulpit, we hope, of course. He's in the pew, he's in the pulpit. But here, the emphasis perhaps is the pew. He's there, seated in the pews. Just imagine the thought, the congregation. And there, in one of those pews, is Jesus Christ. Of course, I speak in an illustrative way, but you understand the truth behind this expression. And you could say he's moving in our midst as well, not just seated. He's moving from person to person on pastoral visits as we meet together, uh, touching this man with encouragement, touching this man with conviction of sin, always for his good, doing good all the time in different parts of the congregation. My friend, this is the vitality of our services, you know, and to be aware of this, and even in the least blessed of them, when we meet together in his name, yet there is power and vitality in these meetings. And it is the difference in our meetings, how empty our meetings would be without him. But we're not without him, that's the point. He's promised to be in our midst, and he is in our midst. And when we meet, he will be there. He will be there. As I said, sometimes we are unaware of him and are careless, but he was there. Mark you my words. There are times we are more aware that he is with us. I suppose I should say, if he is there in all our meetings, will you be there? It's a challenge to us. I know in the times of revival, in 1904, there was such presence in those meetings that it left a legacy. And uh, after the revival, many of those who were saved were afraid to miss the meeting in case, in case that God was there, that Christ was there. Of course, as I said, he's there uh, all the time, but there's a there's sense he has come. And afraid to miss a meeting. Like Thomas, who was not present in the meeting and missed that first meeting and gathering, he was not there. And that desire to be on that occasion when Christ came in greater blessing. And this longing of the heart is speaks of, doesn't it? That he's the one we love. He's the one whom we delight in. And if he is going to be there, we shall be there. You know, when a young man loves a young woman and in that romantic sense and is trying to woo her, to be his wife and uh, to court her, he's very focused, I suggest. And he knows the meetings which this young lady will be in or he hopes might be in. And so he goes to the meeting or goes to the places where this young lady is. If there is that focus on that natural level, and there is, of course, how much more with the one who is uh, the lover of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom we love in the very depths of our being, our blessed Saviour, who has saved us, who has washed us in his blood, dressed us in his righteousness, has had mercy upon us, that came to this world to die upon the cross, to live a life for us, to give it to us, and to die a death for us, to take away our death, to save our souls, to bless us and bring us to God. Well, surely, uh, this is the one whom our heart loves. And if he is going to be present, then we should be thinking, well, he might be there. Let me go to that place. There should be that level of alertness and vitality to our hearts, that we are aflame with love and we wish to meet with him. Well, these things, of course, are the things of blessing, but we can know these things now and they can be like a flame and grow and grow. We trust so that there might be a liveliness in our meetings and in our hearts as we meet with Christ. And all I can say is this, come to these gatherings to meet Christ. 
that is our church at Vertigo C, come to meet with Jesus Christ. And it is, of course, uh, maybe part of our announcements too. Uh, Lord's Day by Lord's Day, Wednesday by Wednesday, we announce all the other meetings. And there in this meeting, we shall have Christ. We often say, so-and-so is speaking. Perhaps we should say we don't, of course, because we could cheapen it. But I say, no, that there in that meeting, Christ will be present. He will be ministering. He will be guiding. He will be blessing. He will be correcting. He will be on his pastoral visits. He will be preaching. He will be fellowshipping. Well, these gatherings, let's come to them to meet with Christ. Or oh, then it might be that wonderful unction and blessing in our meetings. It is something which our hearts sigh for and long for. We pray for more of him and pray he might be manifest in our meetings and might make himself known. But knowing that he is there, doing a good work. Oh, how we pray for a greater degree and more of our Saviour. Let us come before our God now in prayer. Oh, our Father and our God, we pray for these blessings spoken of in this passage. Oh, Lord, we pray not just for understanding, but for experience, that we might know of these things. And these things might be living realities. We might know that touch upon the heart, which we recognize as his touch. Oh Lord, we pray for these things in our Saviour's name, and to the glory of God. Amen. Well, we sing our final hymn, which is 207, hymn 207. God is in his temple, the Almighty Father. And the second verse, Christ comes to his temple, we his word receiving. And then the third verse, come and claim thy temple, gracious Holy Spirit. Hymn 207.
Let us pray. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.